All right, well, I think we can get started. Welcome to the Physics Colloquium. Our speaker this week is Terry Rudolph of Psi Quantum and Imperial College, London. Terry attended University of Queensland, got his PhD at York University, and after positions at Toronto, Vienna, the lab. He joined Imperial College in 2003, became professor of physics there, but then in 2016, he decided to take a leave from Imperial as co-founder of Quantum, a Silicon Valley startup that aspires to build a large-scale quantum computer based on photonics. Harry is widely admired for his many deep contributions to quantum physics and also for his whimsical style. Uh, he is also a gifted expositor. His book, Q is for Quantum, strives to explain the concepts of quantum mechanics to readers with no more advanced mathematical knowledge than basic arithmetic. I think Terry can be fairly characterized as a lover of photons. And what Psi Quantum will determine is whether that affection is to be recorded. <laughs> <laughs> so please join me in welcoming Terry Rudo. Thanks, John. And it's great to be here for a, an in person colloquium. It's uh, if you can't hear me, make sure uh, you put up your hand and tell me to yell. I'm obviously not used to projecting with through the mask. So in, in, in the invitation John sent, it, it had some words to the effect of please try and make sure that, you know, the material you present, this is a colloquium, is intelligible, at least to maybe advanced undergraduates or beginning PhD students. And I'm going to do even better. 90% of what I'm going to present today uh, are slides that I prepared or ways of presenting to engineers. And we at PsyQuantum, about you know, two thirds or actually three quarters of our technical team are engineers who don't know any quantum mechanics at all. So hopefully the majority of the stuff, you don't even really need to know quantum mechanics very deeply. And that's partly because the quantum mechanics of building a quantum computer out of photons is actually very simple, very trivial. This is not a complicated quantum technology. Uh, you know, photons in fact don't interact with these, they're just passing through each other in front of us right now, okay. All right, so this uh, is, no, it's not working. Um, so this is an idealized view of classical computation that hopefully is kind of familiar to you. In most of what I show, time is gonna run vertically on, on, on the screen. And in this case, we start with some input classical bits. We do some gates. The gates are deterministic in general and we get out some output classical bits. Okay, so this is the kind of thing that, you know, if, if you ponder it for too long, you're just like, it's a miracle that, you know, you do this and out comes Minecraft and Twitter and just amazing things from very simple rules in these gates. And quantum computing is normally introduced with an idealized model that looks very similar. So in this, in the idealized model of quantum computing, you start with input qubits, quantum bits, and that little image there, which is an image of a, of a cold atom, that'll be my sort of symbol for a matter-based qubit. And then a quantum computer does something similar. It's like we do, we do interactions between these qubits, we do some gates, the gates are deterministic. And, uh, and then at the end of the day, we get the output to the computation. And in terms of the evolution of the system, it's a nice, smooth and continuous evolution. So this is meant to be an arrow. This arrow is a, a quantum state, which is just a big vector in some abstract space. And the idealized quantum computation, that arrow just sort of moves continuously, nice and smoothly. But at the end of the day, you have to get the output to the computation. We, we need classical bits to read. So we actually have to look at the, the quantum computer, make an observation. At that point, we do a measurement. Measurements are nasty things in quantum mechanics, but we get the output. And we're like, oh, great, uh, you know, my quantum computation works. Now, the most deceptive thing about this diagram is that it takes billions of perfect quantum gates to do something useful. In that diagram, I've drawn 10 of them, and yeah, that would be great. But even if, even if we had perfect quantum gates, 
we still need to be able to do a very large number of them on a very large number of qubits to run any of the algorithms that today we are sure would actually be useful. Okay, so what that means is that we actually have to have a way of doing non idealized quantum computation. And what I'm going to talk about is non idealized quantum computation um, with photons. Okay. But first, I'm going to tell you about a different idealized model of, of quantum computation that uses measurements instead of unitary gates. So instead of the deterministic evolution, you're going to imagine that we have qubits and that we do idealized measurements. So I take them two at a time, say I do a measurement. When you do a measurement, you get out some classical information. So you get out some bit value, zero or one. And then in the next time step, maybe you pick another pair of qubits. You do a measurement, you get out some bit values, okay, and so on. The choice of which qubits to measure is made uh, sort of in consultation with a side classical computer that, that tells you, hey, here's the values that you saw in the preceding time step, go off and measure these qubits, okay. And you run through, and as time goes on, you get a whole bunch of outcomes, and at the end of the day, you get some bit string, and that's your output. So it's still an idealized quantum computation, and you might say, look, why would you want to do this? Because it's obviously more uh, you know, problematic to use measurements because in measurements, I don't get continuous evolution of that state vector. I get something that starts here and then it collapses to being over there and I can't control what happens to the quantum state. And then it collapses over there and then you know, collapses here and there and so on. Okay, so it seems like a silly thing to do to use measurements in the middle of, in, in, in the middle of your quantum computation, but uh, I actually think you can make a very simple argument that measurements in some sense are superior to unitary gates, even in the ideal model like this. And the reason is that you can so well, this is going to be my sort of proof by putting up a paper. You can take maximally mixed single qubit states. And if you just do measurements on them, a very simple measurement in this case, the, uh, this paper talks about a measurement that's just to measure the total angular momentum. Is it, is it spin zero or spin one or pairs of qubits? That will do a quantum computation. Yet, if you try and take maximally mixed qubit states and do unitary gates on them, the state stays maximally mixed. You can't do anything at all. So there's a big gap between what you can do using measurements as your fundamental primitive versus using unitary gates. And what's really going on is that measurements remove entropy. And removing entropy is going to be key to looking at non-idealized quantum computing. Okay. All right. So the models, the sort of two standard, or let's say two extreme models of non-idealized quantum computing. When, when I've got to deal with things where I can't do perfect measurements, can't do perfect gates, my qubits are, are noisy and so on, are these. There's a sort of circuit-based model, which is the first one to ever be sort of fully fleshed out. And in this model, you have static qubits, so like atoms, ions, dots, whatever it is, superconducting qubits. You do gates, you do measurements, and crucially, the, the measurements are not destructive. So you do the measurement, the qubits are still there at the end of the measurement. Okay. At the other extreme, there's a model of non-idealized quantum computing where you start by making a very large entangled state. That's a kind of universal resource. It doesn't depend on the algorithm you're running. You just make this big state. We call it a cluster state. This is called the one-way model. It's due to Rassendorf and Regal. And in this model, the whole computation proceeds by making single qubit measurements. Okay. And now because these single qubit measurements disentangle the qubit, they could be destructive doesn't matter if, if you keep that qubit or not. Okay. The model I want to tell you about today sort of sits between these two. It tries to take the best of both worlds. It's what we call fusion-based quantum computing. Slightly unfortunate terminology, but you know, before uh, I knew I would ever be pitching to investors and trying to explain that this isn't nuclear fusion or uh, talking to people from quantum field theory who think I'm talking about fusion rules. This is just a... Uh, another use of the word fusion and in this model the the basic objects uh, are small constant size 
entangled resource states we call them. So, in, so instead of having like a, an extensive number of entangled qubits, we're going to start with small constant sized resource states. And then we're going to do a two qubit measurement. So not a single qubit measurement, not a many qubit measurement. And we're going to do a two qubit measurement that can be destructive. And that is going to be the thing that drives our computation. Okay. So in order to understand why we like this model, and particularly for photonics, uh, I need to explain to you how these fusion measurements work, which first I have to explain to you how like a photonic qubit or the way that we build photonic qubits work. So the photonic qubits that we build are uh, encoded in waveguides that are etched into a semiconductor like silicon or silicon nitride. And these waveguides, they could be as simple as just a hole or maybe some other piece, some other uh, piece of semiconductor with a different refractive index. But basically, you can confine the light to sort of sub, sub wavelength uh, transversal fields and propagate it down these waveguides. Okay. And the qubit state zero is just, oh, the photon is in this waveguide, and the qubit state one is, oh, the photon is in that waveguide. So those are the two orthogonal states. And then by bringing the waveguides close to each other with, with the use of some tunneling, you can do a non-trivial uh, single qubit gate. Looks like a Hadamard gate. You can do some phase shifters. So you can end up producing an arbitrary superposition over the qubit states fairly easily. Here is a picture that's sort of part of the public record. This is not one of our devices of that kind of thing. You see the waveguides, they bring them together, photon can tunnel across and go out like that. Okay. And, uh, okay, so that's how we do a single qubit gate. And what I want to explain to you is if you have qubits like this, how do we do a really nice two qubit gate? Well, it's very simple to understand how this gate works. And uh, this is uh, sort of the only part I think of, of real quantum physics I'm gonna show you. So imagine that we have those waveguides and I'm gonna draw time going vertically. And so qubit one is the photon is in one or the other of these two waveguides, qubit two is it's in one or the other of those two. And then just like that, that picture I showed you, we bring the two waveguides close together. The photon can uh, sort of go through this thing that's equivalent to a 50-50 beam splitter, and then it gets detected, okay? Similarly, we bring the outer two waveguides close together and, and, and detect them, okay? This does actually a very useful non-trivial gate in the cases that you find one photon at these two detectors and one at these two. Okay. Why? Because if you find a photon here, you do not know, did it originate over here or did it originate over here? Okay. Similarly, this one over here, you don't know, did it originate here or did it originate there? As long as you've erased that information, this, what you end up doing is projecting onto an entangled photonic state. So in this state, the one and the zero are, are vacuum and one photon. It could be that, that, cube, that uh, the first photon was in mode one over here and got detected here, and that the second photon was over here and got detected here. Or it could be the first one was in mode two and got detected here, and the second one was in mode four and got detected here. And you can't tell. So what you do is you project onto an entangled state. And in terms of the qubits that we're using, that means you're just projecting onto what we call the phi plus and minus states, the two qubits, zero, zero, plus or minus one, one. Or if you're more used to thinking about stabilizers, you're just doing a, a, two, uh, a two qubit stabilizer measurement onto x, x, and z, z. Okay. It's an extremely simple thing. We can build millions of these in silicon, and they're very uh, you know, stable, and we can... Make, make this gate work extremely well. So it has many advantages that, that say to us, look, this should be the primitive. Instead of using C not gates or something else, this should be the primitive for your two qubit operations in this architecture, okay? So the things we like about it, well, it's extremely fast. The, detector, the detectors, uh, you know, they sort of responding on, on sort of picosecond time scales. So we remove entropy extremely quickly from the system. The gates are, you know, can be tuned to, to essentially arbitrary ac accuracy. They're manufacturable, so we can make millions of them. But something that's slightly more subtle is that it's, they're kind of classical because a single photon moves through the, the waveguides uh, 
in a way that that you can determine by solving Maxwell's equations. You don't have to do you know solve some Schrodinger equation. You just have to work out the structure of the modes by solving Maxwell's equations. And what that means is that you can also do tomography and test and tune and measure and, and sort of work out what the thing is going to do by inputting classical light, laser light, which you can do very easily, get uh, you know very good statistics on. So in that sense, this gate is kind of almost classical. Okay. Then uh, the two other things that, that we like from the perspective of things that can go wrong are that if a photon is lost, we know. We know we're expecting two detections. If one of these photons get lost, and lost is the main error in photonic quantum computing, we know that, that that has happened. So loss becomes a heralded error, uh, erasure error. And then the other thing is that the photon wave packets could be very big and kind of wiggly. All that matters is that you don't know, did this photon come from this qubit or that one? So these you could have two sort of really big, weird looking wave packets. It doesn't matter that you, you don't have to know what they are. You just have to know they were the same. Then that has implications for things like phase stability and so on. All right, so we really like this fusion gate. So what's not to like about it? Well, there's two things. One, it's destructive. So we can't use the sort of things that, that rely on repeated measurements, like I showed you before, on the same systems. And the other are that some of the time you're going to see two photons here, and that will not project onto an entangled state. If you see two photons here, you know that qubit one was in the state one and qubit two was in the state zero. Okay. So in this case, for this version of the gate, it only works with probability of half. You're not always projecting into an entangled state. Now, there's ways around that. You can either add ancillary photons and increase the success probability or the kind of thing we do, which is just to design the architecture to be able to deal with, uh, with, with the fact that the gate just sort of fails. But when it fails, you know it's failed. You detect the two photons, you're like, oh, I know what state I've projected onto. All right, so that's fusion gates in a nutshell, pardon me. And because it takes these billions of gates to do something useful, and because our way of getting around the fact that even if we have, if we have imperfect gates, we're gonna to need to do even more than that. What you have to imagine is that we need to come up with an architecture where, where we can deal with performing you know, tens or hundreds of billions of these fusion gates on, on similar sort of numbers of photons, okay? So, you know, doing this kind of thing uh, is, is a massive scale machine that we're talking about, at least sort of in, in the quantum sense. And the architecture of how we put the stuff together to deal with the errors and the imperfections is really critical. And so I want to try and explain, and you know, a little bit about how to think about fault tolerance, but this is, within the field of quantum information is sort of one of the hardest and most advanced topics there is, okay? And so, uh, you know, I'm not gonna try and get too down into the weeds, but I'd like to give you a kind of way of thinking about fault tolerance that maybe you haven't heard before. So, uh, so this is, sorry, this is just the date versus sort of the number of qubits and gates you need. And so this is just how smart are the people who are working on this problem? because, you know, steeper gradient. So you, you can just go look at the authors and that's a, a direct um, <laughs> correlation with how smart they are. All right. So I'm gonna give you this very extremely zoomed out view of fault tolerant quantum computation. If, if someone just puts a quantum computer down here and says, this thing is performing a topological fault tolerant quantum computation, what would you see? Well. Uh, you know, you and me, we're basically monkey scale creatures. We can't see the quantum mechanics of what's going on in there. All we're going to see are classical bits. Okay. And what you would see then is sort of in this block of space time here, you would just see a whole bunch of classical bits. And in fact, when you looked at those bits, they would just look random, like a bunch of zeros and ones. And you would say, well, how the heck can this thing be doing a, a computation? Never mind a quantum computation. It looks really random. Okay. But if you start looking into the, the sort of block of space time bits in a bit more detail, what you'll find is that if you take like uh, cubes of the bits and you take the parity of the bits 
on the faces, you'll find that most of the time that parity is even. So it's not that these bits are completely random. Okay. Some of the time you'll see an odd parity, but most of the time on that cube you'll see even. In fact, you'll see there's sort of two types of cubes, which I haven't tried to draw here, um, that are sort of displaced by uh, kind of half a lattice apart from each other. And you would run through and you'd be like, oh, okay, this is, you know, these classical bits, they, they have something is, is determining some properties of them. And then what would happen is that you would hit some kind of boundary in the classical bit. Okay. So it's not a physical boundary, it's kind of a boundary in the correlations where uh, either the, the boundary can be formed different ways. It could be that it's not a whole cube that always has even parity. It's like half of, you know, half of the cube, you're missing a face, or it could be that the boundary is formed by just sort of a skip in, in a half ladder site or something. But you would see this sort of boundary in the classical information. And as you ran through this block of space time looking, at it, you would see that this boundary is kind of an extensive object. And the crazy thing about fault tolerant computation, of course, this, this whole picture originates here at Caltech uh, with, with Kataev. It's that this thing, this boundary is in some sense the, the qubit of the fault tolerant machine. The correlations in these bits here form like an extended qubit and they map. Uh, the, the correlations here map onto the sort of correlations in our idealized circuit that we're trying to get out of these physical qubits. It's, it's quite a remarkable thing when you sort of think about it that way. It's got nothing to do with the sort of underlying physical systems. It's this sort of uh, extended topological object. And if you, as you wandered through the space, you would find more of these boundaries and you would find that sometimes they were brought together and looked like they collided and bounced off each other. And uh, that would actually be the quantum computation running. That, that would be the logical gates of the quantum computation as you were running along. Okay. So that's, that's you know, the, the monkey scale view of, of, uh, what, um, of what you see. So if you could zoom in and look more closely, well, you would say, you know, how, how is this classical bit, this one or zero, whatever it is being produced? And that's when you get to these different architectures. So... In the standard circuit architecture based on the surface code, you would have an array of static qubits like this. And then you would have uh, what you're doing is interacting them. So this is a circuit diagram for how they interact. The four of them run along. You do some unitary gates between them, C0 gates and other gates. And then here's an ancilla qubit that you do some gates between. And then you make a measurement on this ancilla qubit and that ends up being the bit in the fault tolerant computation. And as I said, the, the measurements are non-destructive. So later on, you can go and make more measurements on these four qubits, okay? So that's sort of one way of producing this classical bit. Another way would be the cluster state way where you start with a particular entangled state, this, this particular method is due to Rausendorf. And uh, you, you start with this entanglement and then you, um, you make a single qubit measurement and then the outcome of that measurement gives you your classical bit. But the point that I want to sort of emphasize is that from the perspective of fault tolerance, it doesn't matter how you produce it, as long as it has the right correlation structure, then you're doing the fault tolerant computation. So the way that we want to fill up the space time with the particular types of correlations is, is as I said, it's the sort of thing in between. We now take those resource states for the sort of finite size and tangled states and think of them as just sort of fixed abstractly in the space-time lattice. We then take them two at a time. We do this fusion measurement that I just explained to you how it works. And that measurement gives us the bits over here. Okay. And so all we have to do is sort of arrange these states and this entangling measurement to have the right correlation structure. And then we will do the fault tolerant computation. Okay. Now, from the perspective of the photonics, this, this is particularly nice, not just because the fusion gate is, uh, you know, is easy to do and because we don't care now whether it's destructive, a bit like with the cluster state picture, it doesn't matter that this thing is destructive, but it's also that these photons don't have to live for very long. They basically just have to be produced and then measured. Okay. The other thing to say is that the fusion here 
it's really doing three things okay by choosing sort of the basis in which we fuse we choose what algorithm we're running okay so the fusion is responsible for doing the error correction fault tolerance also for choosing the algorithm we're running and then also responsible for removing the non-determinism we just use a code that doesn't care about lots of losses or lots of erasures and normally in photonic quantum computing if you go like sort of a klm what we call klm version or other cluster state versions what you do is you come up with some way of turning the probabilistic operations of the photonics into something that's almost deterministic and then you add fault tolerance on top here what we're doing is we say let the code just automatically deal with with the fact that the operations are probabilistic okay so this really i think is the sort of simplest type of architecture you can manage you can imagine being consistent with all the restrictions that that we have when we deal with photons for which the measurements are destructive and the interferometry is probabilistic okay so this is going to be my one slide of just high level math this is not the slide i would definitely not show the engineers at psi quantum okay this is just because there's people here in the audience who who are experts in fault tolerance certainly know more than me but what I'm trying to convey on the slide, even if you don't get it, is that it's not very different to stuff you know already. But what I would hope, uh, you know, you come away with from this talk is the idea that the photons are actually more flexible in terms of doing fault tolerance than the static arrays of qubits. Like if you've got to fill up that space time volume using these static arrays of qubits, well, you can only fill up a particular type of geometry. With these photons, you can put, take these resource states, put them wherever you want, fuse them however you want. You get a lot more flexibility in how you make stuff work. Because you, lot, you, got, you get a lot more codes available to you, fault tolerant procedures. But here's the, the sort of very high level math of what happens. You pick a graph. This, this is not actually a fault tolerant fusion network. It's just like want to draw something in 2D. So here I've got four qubit resource states. I'm going to take them to be stabilizer states. And so there's some stabilize a group of these resource states and then you pick a graph or a lattice or whatever and you say i'm going to arrange them on that and so you have that stabilizer group of, of this whole sort of lattice of resource states you have the Pauli group of the fusion measurements Pauli group because you get the plus and minus outcomes on it and uh, then we have the group of what we call the surviving stabilizers which says once we've done these measurements uh, which stabilizers um, commute with those measurements which uh, which elements of the resource state stabilizers commute with those elements and then we restrict those to the unmeasured qubits so in this picture here that the boundary of qubits is unmeasured okay and those stabilizers are the things that that are, you know form the the kind of logical operators if we construct this whole network and properly and make it properly fault tolerant um, and then in order to get the error correction fault tolerance, what we really need are these operators. These are the most important, important folks. They're the check operators. And so these are the operators that, uh, that um, if there are no errors, uh, they would always be plus one. So these are just um, the elements of the resource states, which, you know, if everything worked out properly, we would get that information from the fusion. So in, in, in sort of normal fault tolerant language, the values of those operators are just the syndromes and you would normally plot them on a different graph that we call a syndrome graph. Um, and it's the redundancy in this set of operators that lie in the intersection here that, that gives us the error correction and fault tolerance, okay? Now, the errors just fall into sort of several classes. There's the detectable errors, which are the Pauli operators that do change one of these check operators. That doesn't guarantee that you correct for it because you've got to go off and run a decoder on the syndrome graph and you know work out uh, you know hopefully cor correctly work out what type of error occurred but there's also undetectable errors things that basically don't flip check operators some of those undetectable errors are trivial they don't sort of affect the logical operators and some are not this is all just standard stuff if, if you do fault tolerance but just sort of applied to a slightly different architecture okay Worth noting that um, it doesn't matter ultimately whether the error happened on the resource state or in the fusion. Okay, it's like the spam problem comes to, to help you here. So 
uh, what we can do is describe what goes on by sort of ideal states that we then apply error maps to, and we have an error map that, that sort of captures the fusion errors. And then at the end of the day, all that matters from the perspective of fault tolerance is, as I move through that space-time volume with all those classical bits, do they have the right correlations in them to be fault tolerant, okay? Um, and then the other thing to say that is mildly different to the standard approach is just that because we've destroyed the qubits, when we get an answer from the decoder that says, hey, that type of error happened, we, we can't apply that correction to those qubits because they've gone, okay? So we have to interpret that error as a, as a change in the sort of power the operator on the surviving, um, the surviving stabilizers on the stabilizers on the outside qubits. Okay, I'm just I sort of overview this because I know there's people here that are really experts in fault tolerance, and I think it's actually an exciting paradigm to work in because you just have much more freedom and flexibility on the kind of stuff you can actually imagine building. All right, so what's the story so far? Well, I've run you through a bunch of idealized pictures of Haskell computing, quantum computing, quantum computing using two qubit non-destructive measurements. Uh, then told you about these three models of non-idealized uh, quantum computation, introduced you to fusion measurements, giving you the zoomed out view of fault tolerance. Um, but everything's been very abstract. And I want to just sort of slowly come into the real world as we go through the tour. So the next step is to sort of understand, I just talked about, oh, there's a space-time volume full of classical bits. But if you're really trying to build a, a quantum computer using this architecture, um, how are you going to actually sort of arrange it in the lab? But it's still, for the moment, going to be a little bit of, you know, a theorist's view on how this kind of thing would work. So the key sort of piece of hardware for us is going to be this photonic resource state generator. And so the time scale you should have in mind for this is roughly at a gigahertz, so every nanosecond, this thing is going to spit out an entangled state of some number of photons. I've drawn here this ring of six. This is actually the ring of six is the thing that sort of maps most naturally to the toric code. Um, and uh, in this architecture, if the hardware making this thing is worse, then the size of this resource state will need to be bigger, okay? And the number of these resource states you need, you've got to make a bigger volume of those classical correlations, okay? So there's sort of two things get bigger, but it will still be a constant size, and the number will never be bigger than, I don't know, about 30 or something like that. Okay, so whatever it is, you've decided already, you said to the engineers, all right, you're gonna build me this resource state generator and it's gonna spit out this particular entangled state. It's always gonna be the same one. Uh, you know, you don't have to do anything fancy. Just give me something that on a duty cycle every nanosecond spits that thing out, okay? And in the sort of space-time view or, of doing one of these computations would be, take an array of those resource state generators, okay? Every time second, they're spitting out a ring of six. And most of the, the qubits, of the six qubits, get fused with uh, one from a neighboring resource state generator. So four out of the six, they just immediately get fused with one from the, the four resource state generators next door, okay? But of the other two, one of them gets delayed. So you see here, there's like one that stays lit up. It gets delayed one clock cycle to interfere with one of the six that's produced in the next clock cycle. And that's how we get the sort of 3D-ness in the entanglement here. Okay, so you delay for a nanosecond and then you do this fusion gate and then you fill up the space time with the correlations. And if you've got a smart team of fault tolerance people, they'll have designed it so that you, you actually have um, that you have a fault tolerant architecture. And by choosing some of those fusions in here, you, by doing phase shifters just before you do the detection, you can actually choose what algorithm you run, do the corrections in the logic and so on, if that's what you need to do. And so, you know, uh, the sort of standard story of fault tolerant quantum computing. From a photonics perspective, 
it's really critical that these photons only encounter a constant world line from birth to death they get born and you know they live their little miserable lives for you for you know they pass through a bunch of things and then they die but as i make the the computation bigger the world line of these photons is not getting bigger okay except that we can make use of a concept called interleaving okay which uh which leverages the following fact that for photons there's already an amazing quantum technology that's part of even how i'm talking to people right now through zoom and that's optical fiber optical fiber pres preserves the quantum state of a photon for what you know is a very long time from a photon's perspective okay and so an architecture based on interleaving and i'm, I'm going to explain in a little bit more detail how this works because i think it's interesting for other approaches to quantum computing but roughly speaking looks like this that you just use one resource state generator and a bunch of optical fiber and then you sort of do 3d space-time printing to produce those correlations okay so let me just sort of run through how that works in a bit more detail so here in this uh, picture is a, is a module which has this uh, resource state generator that we haven't specified how we're going to make this entangled state but it, whatever it's doing it's producing the six ring resource state every nanosecond and then the photons that come out uh, they some of them are going to go into a delay so this thing here or here is a delay so this is a delay of say 900 nanoseconds is a delay of 30 nanoseconds okay because my clock cycle is one nanosecond and this delay is really just like a piece of optical fiber so once a photon is in a piece of optical fiber you can't get it out you can't touch it right it's just a it's a one in one out delay so the photon goes in and another photon comes out okay so as these photons go through the delays some of them are delayed some are not the photons you see coming out here are not the ones that they were produced with okay this is one that was already in the delay and this you know this one was produced many many clock cycles ago but they sort of run through this device and then here we have some switches and the switches can choose what happens to each of these photons so for example um, it could say that this photon is going to go to this box here and the f just stands for fusion <coughs> Okay, or it could go to this fusion with its neighbor here. And the fusion uh, that we need here is a little bit more complicated than what I showed you. So what I showed you was just this, which is do a two qubit fusion where you measure the stabilizers X, X, Z, Z. But we actually need this device to be able to do some single qubit measurements as well. And, and even uh, single qubit measurements at a finding angle to do what, what we call a magic state preparation, okay? So, although this looks a bit messy, this is actually, from a photonics perspective, a very simple device. And uh, each of these photons just goes into one of these switchable fusions. So, some, you know, either, either entangling measurement or single qubit measurement. Um, and then in the way this, this module has been drawn, this photon, for example, might come out here and go out what we call the west edge of this uh, of this module so we've got north south east west um after a delay but in the most extreme so in in some circumstances that might connect you to a different interleaving module i'm going through this stuff in detail because i think it is kind of relevant to, to architectures that people here think about uh but in in so it could be that you have some other resource state generator particularly if your resource state generators are slow you might want to have you know more than one of them um but in the extreme case you would just like connect the thing back to itself and do fusions like this and connect it back north south and if you stare at this diagram and the delays for a little bit you find yourself in this world here where you just have a single resource state generator a bunch of optical fiber and you're basically amplifying the entanglement from that resource state generator uh, by a factor that depends on how long is the longest delay that you can have 
Okay, so here my longest delay was 900. So if I did it, it would be like a 30 by 30 array of, of these uh, resource state generators. So it's a, it's a huge amount of entanglement amplification. It's, you know, the fact that you can do this is sort of one of the three reasons why I'm convinced I'm not wasting my life at Psy Quantum, that the long term future of quantum computers is photonic, um, you know, regardless of what happens in the short term. But the reason why I've sort of dwelt on this is that I think it's worth all approaches to quantum computing thinking about the following. This stuff here is very easy to build, very easy. Like certainly a hell of a lot easier than building a thousand build bridges and cooling in millical. Okay. It's essentially trivial. And this resource state generator doesn't require lots of control. You can just imagine something that sort of sits in the dark and knows, hey, I've got to produce this entanglement. And so you can imagine that you produce these entangled photons using some sort of matter based qubits. Because for matter-based humans, small and scale entanglement generation is easy. For photons, it's hard. Okay. For photons, all the long-range connectivity and the, this modularization and scaling up is easy. Okay. That's why we, you know, that's why we've taken that approach. And so I really think we need to, as a community, think more about this kind of thing, which is this sort of hybrid approach where we take the best of matter-based uh, qubits and do transduction into some sort of photonic state. And then all we need are switches and detectors and these delays, and we can actually amplify this entanglement by huge factors. Okay. So you might say, well, what sort of numbers can you tolerate? Unfortunately, I can't tell you what the best codes do because it's all protected information. But if, even if you just sort of take numbers from publicly available stuff to do with surface codes and so on, which are not the best thing. So, you, you know, loss is the main error. You can actually tolerate huge amounts of loss in these things. But uh, even these numbers you look at, you're like, okay, look, if my delay loss, so optical fiber of, of a kilometer might would have a loss rate of four and a half percent. So even if my resource state generator, each photon still has a couple of percent probability of loss, this thing would still be able to run fault tolerated. Okay, so, you know, if you, if, Basically, if anyone asks you anything about a photonic component and says, well, how lossy can your switch be or your, your edge couplers or your detectors or your sources or whatever the hell it is, the answer is always a couple of percent. Because you're going to add up some number of these, the codes you know, can tolerate tens of percent loss, and you don't want to be building more than like a football size, field, you know, football field size machine. And so you work this stuff out and like, you can basically tolerate a few percent in kind of anything which is, of course, much better than what you can tolerate in terms of power of the error. Okay, so story so far, I've now given you the space-time view of FPQC using interleaving. And what I want to uh, finish with now is to show you just, you know, the very basics of the hardware um, and, uh, and, you know, tell you why it is that we think that this thing can work at scale, okay? So the hardware, what is the, what is the large scale photonic quantum computer going to look like? It's not going to look like this. Okay. Many of you will have been into optics labs, seen this stuff like this, your eyes glaze over and you're just like, what the heck? How does anyone make any sense of this at all? Okay. Um, amusingly, the, the final name on Wikipedia is chaotic looking optical, <laughs> which, uh, <laughs> which it certainly is. Okay. So, it's going to look something more like this. So this here is uh, a zoomed in view on a 300 millimeter wafer. So there's a, a few like the top. So the, the places that build your laptops and cell phones and so on, they work on 300 millimeter wafers that, are, you know, using these very, very high quality tools. And this is we make our wafers at Global Foundries, which is one of you know, only three or three or maybe four foundries on the planet that can make such things. Okay, these are much more sophisticated than like academic style clean rooms or smaller scale foundries. And this wafer uh, is something like 25 layers in it in the stack and 500 process steps. And um, I, I don't know exactly, but you know, tens of thousands of sources and detectors on this thing, probably hundreds of thousands. 
so it's a complicated object and and this is all just the photonic part of what we made and what you see here is our version of a grad student okay this is just a robot that goes along and you know we we, we, we produce thousands maybe probably ten thousand by now wafers like this with millions of components can't have a grad student go and measure them you've got to have a robot go along and inject classical light do tomography iterate on the designs and you know send the information back to the engineers okay so the way we automate this thing we have um what's basically the the wafer scale very expensive version of uh, what john probably still has in his car to change cds you put you load the wafers in they sort of run through goes off some robot goes and measures them okay and sends the information back so that we can iterate on the designs so because we can do most of this at room temperature and with classical light not all of it but most of it uh, we can run through huge numbers of components designs we can work out what it is we have extremely precisely and the great thing is it doesn't change from one day to another when you do your unitary gate sort of dynamically with control fields and things like that stuff changes from one day to the next the stuff just stays very rigidly kind of how it is when you first measure it okay so those are the photonic what i'm showing you there is just some sort of photonic hardware but actually we don't take the whole wafer we dice it up into chips okay so here's roughly speaking what happens we take this photonic chip we have fiber attachers on the photonic chip the fiber is to both bring in lasers that pump the sources that produce the single photons and to um, we need fiber to to move single photons either from chip to chip or from chip to the interleaving the, the sort of long delay interleaving fibers okay. and then on top of this photonic chip we bond an electronic chip that's actually a very sophisticated electronic it's got 750 million transistors and if you've ever thought about you know doing control on, on qubits where you have to bring control lines in and can, you know only do this very remotely this is kind of amazing you're putting this complicated thing which runs hot right next to this photonic chip that has superconducting detectors on it. okay uh, it sort of violates my intuition of thermodynamics that you can do this and get away with it but you can okay uh, i'm not allowed to show you the full system here's an old version of of that thing here's the chip is the fibers and i have no idea what this other junk is um we uh you know the new versions do not have this but this i guess was all electronic test stuff but effectively this chip gets stuck or this sort of sandwich of, of chips gets stuck onto a big uh platform like this and stuck into a cryostat okay and the reason we got to put it in the cryostat and 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 cool it down to a few Kelvin is that the detectors that we use are superconducting. In principle, they don't have to be, but in practice, those are the best detectors that, that we can name. All right. So that picture looks very really pretty. It's a bit like this hamburger. You look at it and you're like, oh, that's great. Like, why don't these guys have a quantum computer already? And the reason is that the real world of, you know, when you actually look at the details of how is this <laughs> stuff being made and what's going on and stuff looks more like this. Okay. And so what we have to do as theorists in, at PsiQuantum is understand all of the imperfections of the, of the stuff that we're building. And here are the, the so that, you know, the total number of performance parameters and, and errors and imperfections that we need to understand is somewhere between 20 and 30. Okay. And so here's a list of the main ones, the ones that, that had the most impact. Um, you can ask me about any of those if you want. They all have their own story about how we mitigate them and how we deal with them and all this kind of stuff. But basically, what happens is that the theorists have sort of worked out this parameter space. And what we want to know is, as we, you know, the, the engineers give us like, uh, you know, um, something like this, they'll tell us like, oh, your pump rejection, you know, the best case scenario is x many db of, of suppression and the worst case scenario is this and so we have like parameter ranges for all these things and then we want to design architectures that sit within those parameter ranges okay and so then has taken you know a team of 
again, between 20 and 30 people, several years to write a software stack that lets us do that. It's a highly non-trivial thing to do. This is a very high level view of that stack, okay? Um, it breaks up into these uh, sort of five basic pieces. Each one of these actually has several different software tools and even sort of sub teams working in it. But it starts at the, 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 the simulations of, of the hardware at the component level. This stuff is thermal modeling. It's solving Maxwell's equations with uh, you know, FDTD simulations and so on. And it's this stuff that feeds back to between the engineers and the people who do the experiments and, and the robots and so on as to you know, optimizing designs. And then we take uh, the models of those components and we sort of compactify them and, and make them quantum. So in here, we basically uh, work out circuits, like how are we gonna take these photons and put them on the beam splitters and arrange the detectors and so on. And so this stuff is all photons, second quantized description of photons um, being produced probabilistic by the, probabilistically by these sources. And uh, at the end of these circuits, what we output are small entangled states like bell pairs or GAG states. Okay. And then those, whatever that data structure for those things is, has to feed into these simulations, which look at what is the best way of taking small amounts of entanglement and robustly creating these larger resource states that we need, which could be, you know, a 10 qubit state or 20 qubit state, depending on the hardware performance. This is all tensor network simulations. Okay, some people here are certainly more expert in that than me. Um, but this stuff here, it turns out, there's many, many different variations on how you might put the stuff together and how that propagates errors through the state and all this kind of stuff. So there's a real art form in, in how do you make your resource states have the right types of errors in them so that you, you uh, get, get out of them the sort of biggest amount of fault tolerant entanglement that you can. Okay. At this point, these resource states come out, they go into some simulation tools that are basically like standard sort of stabilizer tools, but applied to fusion networks. So at this point, you're kind of running kind of stabilizer stuff, roughly speaking. And you, you essentially turn these resource states and the fusions into one of those space-time lattices filled with classical bits that you can start checking like, hey, is this thing fault tolerant? And then what we do uh, with that is we have, um, many different types of logical gates that we can do. So the type of resource state we build depends on, yeah, how good or what type of hardware imperfections we have, but also on which type of fault tolerance, uh, approach to fault tolerance we're taking, which type of topological code, okay? Which type of topological code affects what type of logical gates we have. And so we have to translate this stuff into what is the actual error rate on the logical gates when we run a computation on them. Okay, so we're not just dealing with this stuff as quantum memory. We need to know like what are the logical gate errors when we do this stuff. Doing that big process, as I said, you know, a lot of people involved in writing this uh, this stack, but it's quite remarkable because now an engineer can come and say, you know, like the variance in some sort of line width roughness that this tool at Global Foundries is, uh, you know. We, we actually have tools, our own tools in their production lines. We even have a cryostat in the production line, the same place that builds these laptops. We have a cryostat in there. Someone described that as having a jet ski in Buckingham Palace. Okay. So they come along and they say, oh, this tool is doing this, that, or the other. We can run it through this and actually work out a logical gate error. It's, it's just an incredible feat to do this. And it's th that's the reason <laughs> that we have so much confidence now that we know we don't have any unknown unknowns anymore, right? We, we know what we have to do, <laughs> on what scale we have to execute it, on like, you know, what type of stuff and we want to build. And the architecture team essentially lays out different architectures for different scenarios that depend on, you know, the component performance that the engineers are giving us as what they project they will be able to hit or won't be able to hit and that kind of thing, right? So it's not like it's already laid down. You are for sure building this particular type of fault tolerant fusion network. 
I'm still in the process of doing that, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just amazing progress. So I think that's basically my time is up. Here's an old photo of the team. We're now about 150 people. Um, it's obviously pre-COVID. Uh, I have to advertise the fact that we are always hiring talented people. There are many different teams. Not everything is physics. In fact, most of it's engineering, I guess. But many different types of things that we do. Um, and we're always looking for smart people. And, you know, I think it's exciting. You come into a place like this, you can really, if you have a good idea, you can really shift the needle on, on how soon humanity gets a quantum computer. And you can sort of feel that um, when you're there. And that's, that's a very motivating thing. So if you're at that stage in your career, like John, you know, maybe needs to come and work on some foundry engineering for us. That'd be fantastic. All right, I'm going to leave it at that. I'll just leave you with some resources. The papers I've talked about uh, today mostly are this, the fusion-based quantum computing and the interleaving. This is an interesting way of trying to understand fault to tolerance the way we think about it, which is more in terms of channels. I just want to advertise this paper, which should appear very soon, which is how we do these are funky diagrams from this paper, which is how we... Yeah, yeah. It's a, uh, yeah. We should, should be the first name of the quantum computer, shouldn't it? Should this be mishmash? Um, but yeah, so this this stuff is has been critical to our ability. It's a non-trivial thing to get to the point where you can really simulate these logical gate errors. And this stuff has been uh, really important in getting us to that point in our software. So I'll leave it at that. Thanks. All right, thanks for the beautiful talk. About those resource state generators, can you say a little bit more about how they work and how well they work? So the the one the way we do it is very specific to you know the kind of stuff that we can engineer. So so we've been very focused on everything that we build has to be done you know, at global foundries, like in, in a CMOS compatible process. So for us, the resource state generators are built by making um, heralded single photons. So you bring in a bunch of laser light, pump a source, produces a pair of photons, and the source is really just a wiggle in, in some silicon. And because we can change the way we wiggle this thing, we can make pairs of photons at whatever frequency we want. So the, we can we can make the, the photons, you know, anything from a few picoseconds wide to as wide as you want. We can, you know, you get a lot of control because, because you, you don't have atoms. So you're not you're not dealing with Hamiltonians and energy levels and stuff. You're not constrained by, you know, what God chose to give us in the universe. You can just be your own God and make whatever type of photons you want. And then you, we take those heralded photons. We have to switch them. We have to... Uh, send them into interferometers, which do a partial POVM. Now, the thing is that you're only limited by the speed of your electronics. So, you know, we could produce these photons at 100 gigahertz if we wanted, but we don't have electronics that can operate like that. So, you know, we're always with photonic quantum computing ultimately gated by the speed of classical electronics, which is another reason why the long-term future of quantum computing is photonic, right? Because you'll always only be limited by the very best electronics that you have around. Um, and you can just run as fast as you want. So the resource state generators that we have, I said uh, a gigahertz, um, that's just sort of a sweet spot between the speed of the electronics, which in principle can run at a few gigahertz and the fact that we have to do uh, some very simple local logic. When we bring these photons in, we do a partial POVM, so you take some interferometer of, you know, I don't know, let's say six modes and detect two of them and produce a bell state on the output for this kind of thing. You do this partial POVM and then you have to switch those things so that, you know, the process that we have for producing those resource states is 98% of the size of the machine. I don't know if it's 98, but somewhere between 95 and 99, okay? The vast majority of what we're building is just this, these resource states and the photons. And, and the reason that we build in this way is that it's just engineering that we kind of understand how to do it. And we know that we can do it on the scale of millions of times. But what I'm trying to you know, push and advocate and push you all into thinking about is the fact that, yeah, there's like many other ways you can imagine producing these states. And we should be thinking about those. We do it this way because we know how to do it. The photons are extremely pure. Um, you know, they're, they're 
they're very clean and pretty but it's you know the long-term future of photonic quantum computing is certainly not to do this like we're just doing it because it's the way we know how to make stuff done and and you know there's nothing to stop us building resource state generators you know atoms are tiny on a much much smaller scale uh, it's just the, the physics is not there yet i see a few questions sailed in carried by photons and optical sure. fiber from our zoom audience <laughs> uh, here's one from uh, the six chef 30 nanoseconds is a long delay and we'll need a long meander on the chip for that no, it's, it's a optical fiber and so fiber doing and which can also be lossy so is it yeah. a problem so so exactly so the 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 numbers I sort of showed, you know, were like, hey, you can you can always tolerate, you know, a few percent loss. In fact, in, in these long delay, you know, I can't say with the exact in, in principle with this photonic stuff, you can tolerate sort of arbitrary amounts of loss, but that gives you an unreasonably large machine. So in terms of these delays, you have two choices. One is you go, you take go down from your chip into some other layer of semiconductor and into some spiral and delay photons that way. And for short delays, that is the best thing to do. For longer delays, like delaying 900 clock cycles or something, or, or more, thousands, um, then uh, so so the numbers I showed there, I think were like something like 7,000. That stuff all has to be done in fiber. There's just no no question that you got to do it in fiber. And then a lot of your loss is just getting into fiber. So this here, you know, in this kilometer of fiber, you're getting an L squared of 5,000. So you, you basically got an amplification of 5,000 of your entanglement. But uh, you know this would be, say, with surface code, you can only lose 5%. So depending on how well you can couple from the chip into fiber and then from the fiber back onto the chip, that eats into this loss budget. And you know that's why this is not the best way of doing it. But yeah, loss is, loss is the photonic error that, that you have to worry about. And it's just, you know, fortunate that it's a heralded error that we know when it's occurred. Yeah. Uh, you're doing this huge elite scheme with only one uh, resource state generator. And let's say like there's something slightly off about how that generator is operating. So wouldn't you maybe have some huge correlated error? That's uh, a great, that's a great question. It's a great question. Yeah, so the, um, yeah, it's a great question. So I should say that like this is very much an extreme thing. You can build one resource state generator, you can build 10, and you're going to build at least 10 or maybe 50 or something. You're not going to build just one, right? But this is more just to get it the sort of picture clear. But so for us, we don't worry about that because the way we're producing the resource states, if you think about the sort of backwards light cone of the photon that comes out in any, you know, out of any resource state generator, that photon on each shot. Uh, it comes from completely different sources through completely different switches and detectors because the way we're producing them is probabilistic. So yeah, that's a pain because we have to build a giant machine. But in fact, it, it makes sure that we don't get those correlated errors. If you go and build it using, you know, superconducting uh, qubits and, and you use instead microwave photons instead of optical photons, and, and now you would have to worry about things like that and simulate the heck out of stuff like that for sure. We have a couple more Zoom questions, actually, uh, some related questions. Um, one is, how many of these superconducting photon detectors are we going to need? Uh, uh, ultimately, millions, but, you know, we already make, I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say, but many tens of thousands of them, I mean, you know. This is the thing, once you can build something in one of these CMOS processes, these guys who build these laptops, they look at numbers like oh a few billion of this and a few billion of that and they don't care right and we're building in the same tool set they don't care you tell we tell them we need a billion detectors they don't care and you would right. get a similar answer for the sources for similar the answer for the sources yeah that that is the only reason we are following this approach is that we know that it can scale it's not it's not it's not a question whether it can scale <laughs> everything else is you know a pain because of that but at least we know it can scale yeah. yeah. So, uh, I was just curious if you are a module in this interleaving uh, approach and allow you to offering uh, graphs or case, uh, why don't you stick with 
That is also a great question. And I did not say, I said, for pedagogical purposes, I'm showing you the Tory code because people at Caltech don't know anything else. No, that's not what I said. But that's what I should have said. <laughs> yeah, obviously, obviously, Alex, you know, we're going to do, uh, we're going to do what is the smartest thing to do. And uh, that's only as good as I guess the people we have thinking about it. And I'm certainly not one of them. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's a great thing. We can just do, you can, you can, I wouldn't say get arbitrary connectivity, you know, we, st we don't want to be in a situation where we're, you know, building thousands of fibers going into, I mean, it would have to be a very compelling reason. You know, the great thing about this is that you have a small number of optical fibers, so you don't, that does not have to be a manufacturable technology, the, the sort of coupling of the fibers to the chip and that kind of thing. So that's nice. But yeah, um, lots of fun things you can do once you're not dimension constrained. How big is this? Bigger than that. Bigger than that? Yeah. <laughs> really? <laughs> right. uh, so the thing is then, uh, as I said, the, the, the size of the resource state that you need really depends on, on the quality of the components that you get. Now, the only thing we've said publicly about sort of where we're actually at in the hardware is that it's, we're still a couple of years away of, from basically having uh, a, this fully packaged, you can think of this as like the GPU module of, of assembling the computer. And how many of those you need to assemble to get out a particular performance really depends on the quality of those things. And even exactly which resource state you have they're making depends on the quality of, of the components. And so, you know, I know what the worst case scenario is. I don't know, you know how optimistic I can really be. Some days you get super optimistic and some you don't. But uh, in fact, nobody knows until we kind of have this final module like sitting there and we're like, okay, this is... We've now down selected, we're not changing anything else on this, and then we'll know how many of them. Is. And at that point, it's like assembling a data center. You've got a bunch of modules of optical fiber, and it's, it's like assembling a data center. And is it a small data center? Is it the size of this? Is it the size of the room? Is it the size of football field? Really depends on the performance that we get out. But, you know, it's fault tolerant, it's fault tolerant, and that's, that's what we care about. Uh, there's one up there. Okay. Yeah. Go ahead, Nan. Uh, yeah. So you described kind of tying together the different types of sensors to tying together the amplifying segment. Can you elaborate on that? Or the structure of that segment that you're using to make the video? So it's very, very flexible. At, at least, you know. Okay, so, so one of the biggest open questions in this thing is like, why are we making the photons be qubits? You know, what if we go away from stabilizer type stuff? But if you stick to the, the world of, of stabilizers and, you know, finite resource states on some kind of graph, some kind, and then just doing bell pair fusion, uh, you know, you get just kind of whatever you can think up types of entanglement. The problem is that the vast majority of things that you write down will not actually be fault tolerant, not fault tolerant in the sense that, you know, that the, uh, the undetected errors need to have this kind of growing weight and things like that. Um, so I don't think I'm really answering your question other than to say like, it's a very open world. And, you know, we've worked through in excruciating detail, only a few of the architectures through a full simulation and then a whole bunch of other ones that sort of partial levels of simulation and we do it basically, we, 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 we make architectures that target particular components that we think are, are likely to be the most problematic ones. And, you know, you say, you, you know, if, if the switches ends up having to have a 50% loss, could we still build the quantum computer? Well, yeah, we could. Okay, but everything else would have to basically be perfect. And so that's the world, you know, we're just basically plotting out these parameter spaces of stuff. And, and as you change those things, you get so many different options for pushing the uh, long pole in the tent, as it were, to different parts of the hardware. Yeah, I think Alexei had a question. No, do you? I wanted to go up on some places, right? You mentioned that open ferret. 
Uh, it's it's the chi three process. So the the non so the nonlinear crystal is a chi two process. This is a chi three process. But yeah, it's just uh, it's four way mixing. It's nonlinear optics. Basically, absorb a couple of pump photons. We put in you know crazy. So this is another part of the engineering that blew my mind. We basically put in a, a strong laser pulse. You get out a pair of photons, very much like down conversion. That pair actually produced from two pump photons instead of one, which is what happened in down conversion. That means you've got this very strong pulse, and it, you know the simplest case would be the pulse goes into a, a ring cavity, and then the you know the nonlinearity in that produces and then you have some side cavity and two two single photons go into there. And what's crazy about the engineering of this is that the single photon detectors we have they will click with any photon, so we have to make sure that the, the pump light that goes in never gets to the single photon detector. We have to have this crazy suppression, and the amount of suppression, one engineer described it as, as it's roughly equivalent in dB to a nuclear bomb being set off on one side of the building, like up there, turning to snap on your fingers by the time it gets there. Right? It's just crazy stuff because we can't have those those laser photons just scattering through the silicon and stuff, and you know, it all gets to New York. So yeah, I mean the, the source technology, and you know that was a several year project. Make sure that we could just filter this stuff, suppress it enough that that was not going to cause us a problem. You know, when we started the company, a lot of this stuff we were just like, we think it's possible, but like, you know, that could have been could have been the end of us if we hadn't been able to do that. And it took a couple of years to get to that point. Yeah. Right. One final question on Zoom. I'll, I'll paraphrase it. You spoke of the state of the art allowing billions of components on a chip, but isn't that really a characterization, a characterization of silicon electronics? Not silicon yeah, photonics? and, and no, I, I, not on a chip. <laughs> yeah, what I'm saying, I guess, is yeah, you're not going to put billions of, of photonic components because the wavelength, at least, of the you know, we're using telecom wavelengths because of optical fiber and things. You're, you're not going to put billions of photonic components on a chip. Right. Uh, you certainly will do of the electronic components that do the control and manipulation and that kind of stuff. Um, but we don't need uh yeah well we don't know exactly what we do need but you know it's uh you can stare down those numbers if you're just making a module repeatedly like this it's not like we take this thing and have some grad student glue this chip onto this right this stuff is assembled at the same packaging houses that assemble your laptop and and you know you have to believe that they can do what they say they can do, and if they can do what they say they can do, then yeah, you can stare these numbers down. Now you don't want obviously like for us minimizing the total number of sources will ultimately be the sort of footprint parameter that matters to us most. We're not we're not you know we're not going to be worried about say total cooling power or total laser power or anything else really other than total number of sources. I think. Okay, well it's gotten pretty late, so let's. Uh... Wind it up, but let's thank Karen.